kind of get the message out there in the UK press. Thanks, Teresa. Okay. Emily, so you go right in. You, you kind of get in and get dirty with um, organisations, services, and... Uh, yeah, I think it's really important um, when we talk about in-house and how that represents out and what are the resources that we have that we can be so busy kind of going, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to provide this, and we forget intrinsically what we already have. I, yeah, if you could introduce yourself and talk a bit about what you do, that would be great. Sure. So um, I'm a marketing strategist and consultant. Um, I've been a partial owner of a treatment center that's well known um, in the U.S. and have been and also done direct client care. Kind of that's how I started my career in this field. And um, so I've kind of seen and I've started from you know a kind of a direct client care all the way up to you know a, a C-suite level. And so I've kind of seen every portion of what it's like to be in a treatment center and how it operates. Um, and so, you know, as I've moved away from being a part of an actual treatment center and attached to one, I really love kind of as part of my job is to get in there and kind of figure out what are um, kind of what is the what is the mission behind the company and what do they actually do and why they're doing it, and then figure out the pieces within the company that are providing that service, and then how do they best market it, um, and then looking at all the processes and um, within the company and systems and how best is it being utilized or is it not being utilized. Um, so I look at everything from family programs to alumni services to differentiators within the market because right now the market's pretty saturated as we all know and especially in the US and I know it's becoming more and more saturated here in Europe and so really looking at companies and saying what makes you different? Everyone's individualized. Everyone says you know client-centered treatment. Everyone says gender specific. So why are you different than everybody else? Why am I going to choose your program over another? Um, and then working with the marketing teams and helping building great marketing teams and infrastructure within them to help them best market that and also make sure that we're the, they're aligning um, what they're marketing with the actual clinical services. So I'm never in the in the west coast of the U.S. I'm never going to say like we're going to go swim with dolphins and I go to the program and they're not doing that and they're in the desert, right? So and that happens a lot. Or I've got this amazing swimming pool or whatever, and I don't. I, I actually... We don't talk about swimming pools. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No swimming pools. <laughs> sorry. Um, but again, it just the oversell and under-deliver. And so you see that happen a lot. And so working with admissions teams and how do you best convert a call for the to align with what the actual program is doing. And so, um, yeah, that's basically what I do. I suppose it's about getting the balance as well, uh, you know, uh, especially when you come to sort of a alumni and how to really, um, the power of attraction rather than promotion and yes. not, not abusing that and what is ethically sound. So, you know, maybe people will have some questions on um, how to build your marketing through your alumni. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. West. Wow. It's nice to see you come up from a computer. I never see you in front of a computer, so it's <laughs> kind of like nice to see you come up from Just a computer. He's, he's the technical man of this conversation. Um, um, well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure yeah. to have you. I'd like to, you know, I know that you represent uh, both in the US mm -hmm. and the UK. Mm -hmm. um, you probably have a, a you know, it's quite dynamic what's been going on you know, with like the Google, the AdWords, the pay to click. I presume that that was a moment that you went, ha ha, we can sort out your SEO. <laughs> um, or, you know, advantageous to, to many, not to others. And it's created some, mm -hmm. it, you know, if you were weak, um, are you stronger now? Are you, there's weaks and strengths, weaknesses yeah. and strengths. Sure. Um, I'd really like to know a little bit more uh, because I couldn't get NATAP here because uh, they had a conference in the States, which I totally understand, but <coughs> wanted to m know more about legit script mm -hmm. and what that was because I felt like it was a scam um, and not really what it was packed up. And we don't have anything like that in this country. So there's mm -hmm. some questions there for me and I'm sure there's going to be some from the audience as well. So if you could just kick in. Sure. I'll kind of 
start with the same format and happy to get into all of that, yeah. those details as well as we progress throughout this. Um, so I'm, I'm West, I'm from California. Um, I founded a company called Incredible Marketing. Um, so we've got about a team of about 85 or so spread across four offices, so three in the States and then uh, one in Australia. Um, and we do basically digital work, so that's really our umbrella. So everything from websites to social media marketing, um, you know, social media advertising, pay-per-click, uh, search engine optimization, reputation management, email marketing, but a lot of content creation with that as well. That's really kind of like the foundational element of all of this. Um, and really, rather than doing those things in silos, um, our focus is more on creating content marketing as a campaign. So everything really feeds off of itself, right? Education is the number one thing. Um, a lot of people that do marketing uh, focus really on kind of the bottom portion of, of a funnel, if you will. So if you have a lot of like patients that are in a journey and loved ones that are in a journey to find help for, for someone they really care about um, that's struggling, you have this big funnel. And at the bottom, people are ready to convert and go to a facility, but at the top, they're educating. They don't know if the timing is right. They don't even know if their loved one or themselves have a problem. Um, so really, if you can create a resource library and educate people, you can hit people at all segments of that patient's journey and do it in a really altruistic, wholesome way, where even if they never come to your facility, they're getting some sort of help and on the right path. But if you do it in the best way and use a little bit of science and some digital marketing strategies, you can be the source to kind of guide them through that. So when they're ready, they'll come to you. So. Um, for us, being in this space uh, is more about um, kind of being an example of how to do stuff right. There's a lot of things that have been done very wrong in the States uh, in terms of digital marketing um, from a very unethical standpoint. Um, it's, you know, I mean, literally it's, it's killed people because they've gone to facilities that are just really horrible. Um, so our standpoint in this space and why I'm coming to do these things internationally is to a ball in the states, set a good example, clean things up, work with people that are doing the right things. But over here, hopefully, do some preventative measures because a little bit of the corruption has happened over here as well. Um, but hopefully, it's not going to end up scaling as much as it did in the states. So we just want to set a good example for that type of thing. One of the things that you said yesterday, which I think is interesting, is West also incredible marketing. Actually, uh, percent, larger percentage is sort of medical, m medical services. Yep. And the wonderful thing about medical is that outcomes can be measured. You know, <coughs> successful cardio operations is, you know, this market, working in this industry, outcomes and being able to market based on outcomes is so difficult. So I would be really interested to kind of open that up. I'm <coughs> sort of answering my own question, which is, you know, what is one of the vulnerabilities of this? of this field, and I think it is to do with outcomes. So I wondered if anyone has anything to say about that. Sure, I mean, I could chime in on, on some of that. Uh, and yeah, to give perspective as well, um, the treatment space is actually the minority of, of my business. Um, it just happens to be the majority of my time. Um, I've come from a background of, of a family in addiction, so I've, I'm one of the lucky ones who learned super early never to drink and never to use, but basically everybody in my family is either in recovery or in active addiction. Um, so that's why, and I've lost a lot of friends to it, so you know, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm here even though most of the company is, is still kind of in the medical space, that's where we started. But the last four years, this is all I've focused on. And so yeah, I've learned a lot coming from the medical space. Even conferences are organized differently there. Um, but essentially, and in, in, again, I'm, I'm a marketing guy, so I can't get too deep into outcomes. But essentially, the big difference that I've, I've seen in terms of that, which isn't necessarily marketing specific, is, you know, 100 years ago they agreed on what terminology they're going to use to, to measure outcomes and what kind of data sets that, that would be important. And at least for the last 50 years in every medical vertical that I've ever worked in, they've been measuring them. And we're very much in our adolescence, so uh, we just, we haven't quite got to that point yet. Um, you know, the industry blew up a lot over the past 10 years or so. and. Um, Connecting on that is going to be one of the biggest differentiators for us because as soon as we can do that, we can provide a lot more value to people um, who need help, who have better outcomes. Um, and when they're measurable, we'll be able to, uh, in the States anyway, get more um, uh, more funding from insurance companies, which is very difficult at this, at this specific moment. Mm. 
Um, you want to say something? Yeah, just two things. Um, when you guys were talking about um, deaths um, in Canada, we recently had a death in a treatment center, and it certainly wasn't the first one, but it was very public, and there was a lawsuit brought against it. But the good thing that came out of that, which I think is what actually needs to happen when bad things happen, right, a silver lining, is that there has been a number of guidelines that have been implemented now in all the treatment centers they had to. So, you know, now all clinicians are going to have to be, uh, there's not going to be an allowance really, not that lived experience won't be valued, but there will be a need for every clinician, each counselor will have to be certified, and each treatment center is going to have to either be par for one of the other accreditations. So, you know, out of sometimes a really negative thing does come a positive, so that's happened in Canada, so I'm happy to say that. And then for outcomes, what I wanted to say is that it, it's crazy to me, because I've worked in a number of treatment centers in Canada, Outcomes to them is phoning somebody after a year saying, are you still sober? Right. Yes, you are. Great. Take, we have a success rate. Click. Like, are you kidding me? That is our outcomes. So until we have a better way to actually track whether people literally are still whatever they consider to be success, and that's the other thing. How do you define it? How do you define recovery? How do you define, you know, when somebody's in, in remission? So quality of life as mm -hmm. well. Exactly. Well, you define it by defining it. <laughs> but there's yeah. no there's no one definition of addiction or recovery that everybody can agree on. So yeah, we're and, all and it needs to be global as well. Exactly. So, so yeah. until the World Health Organization yeah. or somebody like that actually mm. gets on board and everybody agrees to it, we're all still. So, at this point, before I come, I've got some prompters, but you're in this audience for a reason because you've got some questions or you've got some stuff going on or you've got something to say. Um, does anyone have a question? Wow. Burn desire. Hi, George. <laughs> Please. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a, probably just a general question, but to what extent does digital Google search, things like that, actually play a part in people's decisions, or mm -hmm. is it personal experiences, other people's personal experiences, personal recommendations? Sure. Um, I guess I'll handle that one since it's digital. Um, so my, I'm, I'm of the opinion that your number one um, marketing channel should be your alumni um, in terms of referrals. Because if you're doing really great work, typically they're going to have friends and family that need help as well, and they should be referring to you. So that should be your number one. And that comes from doing great work and, and some basic things to stay in touch with your alumni. Now, that said, I'm also a big fan of diversification in terms of marketing. So that's one awesome channel. Um, another one is digital. And if you do it appropriately, it can be a great channel for you. Um, if you do it in a way where you're just basically spinning wheels and doing things to do things without a real strategy, it's probably not worth it at all. Um, and then outreach, which you may want to chime in on, um, is a huge portion of it as well. So having, you know, it's, it's maybe, from what I understand, a little less common here, but in the States, outreach is a really um, vital part of communicating yourself to hospitals, to other networks where you may receive referrals and stuff. So it's really, it's kind of a trifecta along with a few other things, but it ultimately it comes down to measuring um, and seeing what's working and what's not. Um, iterating on that, pivoting if you need to. Yeah, I would piggyback on that. So I absolutely agree, diversification. I think anybody who dumped a bunch of money into the internet found that when Google kept changing, uh, that they lost money and it, you know so I believe absolutely and the same thing happened with outreach where everybody put all their money in BD business development and you know uh, all the competition came and then you found yourself competing with and everybody is looking for the same referral sources and so diversification I think is absolutely necessary um, alumni yes and I think family program is part of that alumni service so provide because the families if they have a good experience they're gonna also refer um, but I would say about outreach too, there's a thing that happens in the US and I've seen it a little bit out here in the work I've done in the past year here is um, not just doing outreach for outreach. So it, you see it a lot in the US, we talk about like marketer, marketing to marketers. There's no strategy in that. But really working with a business development team and, and finding the people that understand how to um, strategize on who are you asking the business from, who makes the most sense to get your business from based on what the services you're providing and then being strategic about asking for business and also receive, giving business. So working with a treatment center and then an outpatient program or working with, a, if I'm an addiction program, I'm gonna work with a mental health program because I don't provide mental health, I only provide addiction services. So diversification and outreach in and of itself has to be there um, because 
it's a very saturated market. And in the past 10 years, and even the past two years, it's gotten even more saturated. And so um, that's all I would say about that. It's kind of a question. How do you define marketers marketing to marketers? <laughs> what, what does that mean? What does that look like? What's going on there? So let's per se, there's a conference or an event or a lunch and learn, and the majority of the people that are there are outreach people, meaning my job is to market my program. And is what to I'm, get clients. Your job is to get clients. My job is to go and find business to bring to the business, correct? Mm-hmm. To find clients. Right? Yes. I okay. said he was a disruptor. So, and, and, and so to find referrals yeah. for, from individuals that will refer business and clients, correct. And that could be other people marketing their own program. Correct. But sometimes what happens is you just have these events and this money that gets spent in these various um, avenues that they're just marketing their programs to each other and not being strategic about how they are going to help people. Again, it goes back to the idea of what's in the client's best interest or the refer- referral at best interest. So rather than just marketing my program, I'm going after a specific type of person that I know that they treat a type of client that would benefit from my program. Rather than just going to market to mm-hmm. West, who let's say he's just a marketer for another program and just going out and having lunch and talking about what we do, but well, not well, actually what he strategizing. Does is, is much different than what marketers marketing to marketers just an stuff. example, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's people with, and so, and the other individual might have clients that would be better for your program, and you might have clients that would be better for their program. Correct. Well, so kind of cross-reference. Insurance, right? Yeah. It used to be about insurance. Pardon me? I'm saying it used to be about insurance. They, if they didn't take an insurance, then they could swap the insurances. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's what that was about. Okay. So, okay. And, and overall, there's, there's, a, there's a big difference between you know, people who are doing outreach, connecting with each other and saying, well, I need to fill my overall quota, quote unquote, mm-hmm. and, and, and you need to fill yours, so let's try to reciprocate versus okay. uh, uh, an outreach person going out and taking out a bunch of clinicians and educating them truly on what their program does and opening it up saying, you know, if you get somebody that you realize wasn't um, in psychosis because of meth, but they actually have schizophrenia and we're a mental health specific program, you should probably refer them to mm-hmm. us and we're a resource in your area. So it's, it's, a, it's a difference there. And there's been so much money put into the outreach that yeah. a lot of times it's marketers can and I, marketers. Can I just add something Thank else? You. Sorry, because I know the original it's question was about digital marketing. Um, so the clients I work with, they, they do a lot on digital marketing. They do a lot on um, outreach or business development. But what we also find works really well is, if, is, is profiling the really good quality clinicians and making them the experts because at the end of the day, they're the people that are, that are giving the treatment, that are running the treatment programs. So we feel that that's a really important part to market. Anybody else got a question? Sorry, sorry so do you have any data to support that? Uh, so what sort of data do you so mean? Have you done an article on any show? Oh. Yeah, it might, it might. It may be that we use the clinician as an expert, a spokesperson. So, yeah, I mean, I've got one chap in the UK that we use, and he is um, quoted several times a week in the national press. And, you know, it, it's, I mean, I can't give you an exact conversion of what business it's bringing him, but I know that it certainly completely changed the landscape of his profile. He hosts his own radio show now, so, um, and that's as a result of building up his, his profile. The radio show is all about mental health, so it's you know it's a great um, outlet. Has anybody else got any questions? Yes. Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question, and this is probably a complicated question, or it can be answered in a lot of different ways. But I'm curious about individual private practitioners that are building their brand. If they're um, again complicated question, if there's one specific marketing technique of all the techniques that that there are, that should be the priority when you're kind of initially building your brand or what you would suggest is the number one thing that you should focus on, at least initially. If you're in private practice? Yes. Yes. Well, I, I mean, my, my thing would be their own personal profile. Yeah. Their own, I mean, there's obviously everything, you know, all goes hand in hand, but unless you've got a really good product and really good content, there's nothing to place on your digital and there's nothing to use for your outreach so I would say um, just because of like the b2b work I've done I would depending on what my expertise is is finding the people that are 
either trying to serve that population and or where that population exists and marketing my services directly to them because that would probably get your highest return on investment in terms of your time. Um, and really also being a collaborator with other people who are providing that same service so you can become an extra referral source for them. Mm -hmm. So even people have been doing it longer than you have and they can essentially send you business if they can't provide it. Yeah. So I guess kind of to add on to that, so you'd say kind of more direct personal relationships are more important than investing money in building your website or... To start perhaps, off. Yeah, social media. So you can have money. Sort of thing, yeah. okay. um, and I want to add the, a little bit of a digital component to that yeah. too. Um, so I think that that is, is a huge foundational base that is absolutely necessary. And if there is going to be a digital component, um, I wouldn't necessarily focus on SEO in the beginning. Um, maybe you'd have a social media presence, but just to have a presence, right, to post occasionally things that are relevant. Um, but what I would do is, as you're doing that business development, um, start to gather emails and get opt-ins and figure out what kind of content's actually going to be really uh, important to them and actually educate them and have a professionals list and it's something that you can even do yourself and do one email a month and just send it to them it's something that's actually beneficial and not overwhelming um, and then lead them to a blog or to a short video that you can also do yourself on your site and it could be an inexpensive site it could even be a Wix website because you're not doing SEO on it um, and then there's something you can do on social media that's an advertising form that's very inexpensive um, and works very well to serve only those people now, if they spent three minutes reading your blog, you can measure that, and you can serve only those people who spent three minutes reading your blog and ad. So it's not a very wide audience, but it's very specific. And that way, the next time you come out with a blog, they're gonna see that ad for you for the next blog, and they're gonna click on it, you're constantly gonna be in their sort of, in sort of their view, essentially. Sure. Would you say the same thing as private practice, treatment center, treatment service? Same thing? Uh, the treatment center should be doing the same thing as well, but there's quite a bit more that would be going on, on top of it as well. Um, it's going to be a bit more competitive, um, and the cost per acquisition is going to be higher, et cetera, so there's a different strategy. They should be doing those things too, but if I had to pick off like the most important ones um, that are also uh, the most affordable for somebody who's starting up or in a private practice, mm -hmm. th th that would be a kind of the, the couple that I would do. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Andrew. Yeah. Um, Thanks, West. Um, I've actually had the pleasure of working with West, and we went through a legit script uh, certification. So I'm curious now, after I think it's been at least a year and a half, right? What are your thoughts about the success of it? Because to some extent, mm -hmm. it feels that um, you know it's not that difficult to get into legit script. And I'm wondering whether the focus should be on a buyer beware. Um, almost, how do you educate? I mean, I heard you talk about education, but how do you educate consumers? Uh, and give them some kind of media literacy classes before they get on the internet, which is also a broader sort of subject as far as fake news. And I mean, we're all sort of digitally yeah. overwhelmed. And I'm sort of curious about your thoughts about that. Sure. Can I just interject? Could I just ask for those of us in the UK, clarification on this thing that's been referred to called the script? You're going to get this now. Okay. Sure. I'll, 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 script, I'll describe yeah. it so you guys can, yeah. for those of you who don't know, can kind of understand it more. Um, so, legit script, it's two words. Legit and script. It's just a company name is all it is. Um, it's a company based in, in Oregon. And uh, they um, essentially got their name um, and sort of recognition from starting to regulate, regulate the online pharmaceutical space. There was a lot of corruption in that in the earlier days of the internet. Um, and so they went through a process of validating online pharmaceuticals essentially. And so uh, there was a point in the past when Google and Bing and et cetera banned all ads for online pharmaceuticals. Um, and until they found a company like LegitScript, and there's a few others as well, um, that basically um, go and they call the company and there's an application process and you have to essentially get certified by them to show that you're legitimate enough to run ads and you have to follow a certain set of rules. Um, so that's kind of the history of LegitScript. Now, uh, a few years ago, two years ago, something like that, um, Google banned all ads overnight, uh, initially in the US, for addiction treatment terms. Um, and so when we speak of diversification, just to bring up something a little bit more granular on that, even in digital, you should have diversification because a lot of people were spending all their digital efforts on paid ads, or all of their marketing efforts on paid ads. And so a lot of businesses went under overnight as a result of that. Um, some 
some really good quality businesses that just didn't have the proper marketing channel set up, and then some that, that weren't. Um, it would just kind of hit everybody. Uh, now, essentially, there, there's a long period of time, six, eight months or something like that, where uh, there really was no process to apply to anything um, to get your ads back up. Um, so it became the Wild West, and there was a little bit more demand for things like search engine optimization, which is um, the organic, the natural way of ranking in Google, not the paid way, but the way of working with its algorithm and trying to prove your worth to Google, essentially. Um, and then, uh, then LegitScript came out, and they partnered with uh, Natap and uh, you know, some of their board members, and, and I think Facing Addiction as well, which is a nonprofit in the, the United States, and uh, kind of came up with, uh, with a vetting process. And the idea was that we need to roll this out as quick as we can, and we're gonna also be meeting regularly to rapidly iterate change in this, because we know it's not gonna be perfect in the beginning. Um, and so essentially, um, they started that, but they got a lot more demand than they realized um, they would have, and so it's been a very slow process. Some people, uh, it's taken over a year for them to get certified. Some, a lot of people, six months is a pretty common number. Um, it's uh, something that's gonna be rolling out here as, as well, theoretically, because ads are banned here now as well. Came a little bit later, but they're, they're offline. Um, at this point, LegitScript is not, um, and Google, neither one of them have, have said anything about a timeline for that. It's rumored that Canada may be before the UK, um, but we'll, we'll have to see. They try to keep that very, very secretive and quiet. Um, I haven't seen any changes in terms of their, their process for um, adding additional questions or making the, um, uh, the application process uh, any more detailed. Um, per Andrew's question, uh, it's, there, there's, a, there's several facilities that have gone through it that are not, um, not, not really great facilities. You know, um, the, the, the one thing that it's done in a really positive way uh, is that there, it, for, for the websites that are out there in the States that are um, essentially uh, lead gen or patient brokering are doing really deceptive things online, they're not able to get online anymore. Um, so they may not have a good facility. I, that's something I'm hoping we can clean up and kind of create more of a standard on and more educational content around and educate the, you know, the, the, the patients and the loved ones on how to like really drill into details about how to validate where they're going to send themselves or a loved one. Uh, that's something we kind of need to unite around a little bit more on and create some more content around. But um, you know, all it's really done is, is kind of save us from, uh, from, from some of, some of the, the patient brokers out there, which is a good step, but it's, it's very just one, one slice of the pie of what we need to fix. Yeah. I kind of was trying to answer no, a lot no, of those. I, mean, I, I get it. It's just yeah. a sort of mind thing where it's almost like we should have some kind of disclaimer, much like you know, with cigarettes. Look how far the UK has got the cigarettes. So yeah. now you can't even see the brand. Um, but there should be something similar where there is some kind of media literacy, education, or training. Mm -hmm. uh, because people who are responding to website ads are basically in a state of crisis. So when you're coming from a trauma place, it's, it's your limbic system, and so you can't even yeah. really sort of reason very well. And so you really need to be in a sort of safe space to be able to make logical, rational decisions. Sure. I've got a thing. I don't really yeah. understand. Let's say, one I do know in the States, so you've got CAF, uh -huh. Quality Assurance, so you've got the Joint Commission. Um, here we've got CQC. I, I know we're not legit scripting yet, and who knows, but... Where are they getting involved in sort of um, advising or where are Google looking towards to the actual organizations that are certifying us? Because LegitScript has nothing to do with that, but yet these are the organizations that are meant to be saying that we are quality assured. Like where do they come in? Well, there's, there's a... Uh, <coughs> A different <coughs> approach to it. So LegitScript, although it gathers a lot of the same information as Joint Commission, as an example, um, they're also getting more granular in terms of the online information. So they're taking, as an example, uh, anybody who's an owner in the company and looking at all the domain names that they own. Um, that's something that's in the digital sphere to see what sort of online properties they may have that could be related to something deceptive. Joint Commission wouldn't do something like that, but Joint Commission would do something like making sure you have exit signs on every one of your doors in case there's a fire. 
So it's it's sort of a different thing. They cross over in some ways. You know, making sure you're 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 licensed appropriately and that type of thing with you know the state, etc. Um, but then they also spread out to, to kind of different areas of their, their specialty. So a bit of a lack of a join up there maybe for a whole whole, yeah. whole journey. I, same kind of similar story. Yeah. Anybody else got any questions? There's Butch has got one at the back and then we'll oh sorry. Do you have one? Yeah. Butch, <laughs> ladies first that. this time. Okay. Thank you for all being here. Um, so I know that a lot has changed in this industry, and I'm sure with your careers, you've seen a lot as well. Um, and so I just wanted to know what um, important ethical standards or advice you would have um, for now for marketers, both doing digital and business to business. Um, what are some important ethical standards or questions or in terms of, because everyone is sort of linking up to survive, at least that's how it is in the States. A lot of people are you know, buying each other out or they're trying to partner up because they're just trying to stay in business. Um, and I'm, things are rapidly changing here as well. And uh, with a lot of newer programs, what are some really important marketing standards and ethics that you would want to say to those people? So yeah, I'd like to bring you in on this a sure. little bit. to something specific? Um, yeah, I think I think what I'm saying is is how honest and how vulnerable c can you be? And when you raise the flag on um, organisations and sort of say they're not doing good treatment or, it, it, you know, The volatility, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Is I'm saying, and all these organisations joining together. How do you come and say, uh, you know, we are, if we're an individual, uh, that what we're doing is good? How do we say we are different? Um, and you know a lot of different treatment centres. I don't know the answer to the question. Okay. How do treatment centres portray themselves as doing good work? <coughs> Yeah, how do you, in a market that's getting, um, <coughs> organizations are joining up and joining up, how do you stay individual? How do you stay ethical? How do you keep on track um, as an individual treatment provider? Are there any individual treatment providers here? Would one of you like to answer this question? Butch, would you mind? I've got the mic, so it's a good opportunity, isn't it? I'm Butch Glover, and I'm the CEO of Cumberland Heights in Nashville, Tennessee. Come visit us. Uh, the, the, to, let me answer a couple of things first. The, the, um, I encourage you to go to the NATAP, N-A-A-T-P website, and uh, as, as far as ethics and, and all of that good stuff, they have what's called the QAI, which is the Quality Assurance Initiatives, that really outline uh, what joint commission versus legit script versus everything. The joint commission doesn't really monitor the business practices of organizations. They're, they're more leaning towards clinical and exit signs and things like that, and they, don't, they never delved into. So it's, there are people in the states that they have a business of selling manuals that will get you joint commission accredited. <coughs> So that's, that's how it works. Uh, we were actually vetting facilities five years ago after getting, we referred a, a, a young adult to a place in uh, the south uh, after treatment with us and uh, the mother called me, cussing me really bad, uh, about the $162,000 uh, EOBs that she had and a bill uh, that she had to pay for less than 90 days of treatment. And, just, and at that time, it was the, the urine testing, there was the genetic testing, there was gouging the out-of-network uh, game and all of that good stuff. So we started, uh, we, had a, we had to do our own due diligence of where we were referring people, and we aligned ourselves with people who were doing it right. Now, right can be a lot of different things. You know, when you go from a 15, $15 billion industry to a $35 billion industry, 
in less than um, like four years, five years. You know, there's corruption. You, you can tell it for sure. Um, I, I'll be glad to talk with anybody uh, privately if they'd like to talk about what we're doing. Uh, I think, you know, uh, to be a ethical, uh, how to communicate who you are, uh, it's, it's people. You know, you, you got to go talk to people. I mean, we, we don't put ads out and say, hey, we're ethical and we're doing it right and all that. But we just, we align ourselves with people like Wes, you know, that, that advises us in that space what we need to do, you know, because we don't know. Um, anyway, thanks for letting me share. I mean, I think, you know, I'm sure all of us can think of occasions where we have read outcomes being published by so-called well-respected treatment centres. And we might all have thought at some point, well, on what are these outcomes based? Especially the 99% ones. Yeah. You know, and when, when you see an outcome and you know it doesn't chime with the reality of a enduring condition with chronic relapse as a, as a key feature um, and to see and I've seen it in in major UK you know weekend premium newspapers where companies have secured coverage with statistics that are I have no doubt without ethical basis and to think that families can read that and be seduced into thinking my son or my daughter may be saved because look at what these people are doing I just find it unforgivable so that's something that I you know can, Teresa can hmm. I ask you to come in on this because there has been quite a lot of this recently but I think hmm. it is important to talk about how the media and you're the kind of yeah. Bridge between. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of those statistics will be self reported um, and there'll be statistics based on that particular treatment centre, how many people have maybe been through their programme, how many people have completed the programme, how many people have stayed clean after one year, five years. Um, and, um, I mean, there is no real regulation on it. You're right. You know, I agree with you. Um, but, I mean, I think particularly the journal... I mean, I'm a member of the Guild of Health Writers, um, and I, I work very closely with a lot of the health journalists in the UK that are editors for the national press. Um, and, you know, and they're, again, use the word genuine. They are genuine people that care. And, you know, a lot of them, when I speak to them, we talk about... Um, how addictions affected them or their families. And I do think that they report ethically, um, but they can only go on the information that we give them. Um, but, and that's why it kind of goes back to, you just have to be, you just have to be very good at your job, really, to be able to kind of smell a rat and then notice that, you know, this isn't right here or, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm proud that I, you know, I work with, um, with what I call genuine operators in this area. And if, if I thought I was working with, some kind of cowboy, I, I wouldn't feel in any way comfortable about getting that person that type of coverage in the national press. So you're really going down to people's morals and ethics and, and that's it at the end of the um, day at the moment, I, I, just, I, I believe. I might not be one, I might be one there. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to one sentence, just a very short point. Um, I, I have a history, I ran a market research company for a bit as well and anything for data collection including outcomes if you're collecting it in your own company, is inherently going to be invalid. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, it's just not going to be, be valid data. So we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, there's even some outcomes companies in the States that are still relying on the company to gather their so outcomes. They're just supplying supply the software to track yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. that needs to be rethought out. Absolutely. Yeah. Out of those uh, people that kind of put their hands up as individual or non group, you know, how many um, outsource their um, outcomes or do collect data? Mm -hmm. Leonard, what were you going to say? Um, 
in the States, it seems like most of the, if not all the publicity is bad regarding treatment centers. Uh, <clears throat> it seems as though every week a, a treatment center is closed or someone's arrested, uh, and that makes the news. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to this organization, NATAP, and I said, why don't you have all your members put in a couple thousand dollars? And how many members do they have, Butch, NATAP? Oh, I don't remember. I know 170. Uh, At least. You know, I think it's about 170. You know, so I have a media company. I said, you know, why don't you have all your members put in a couple thousand dollars to create some PSAs, maybe some short films, some testimonials, something interesting in favor of this industry? And it didn't happen. Uh, and it seems so. Even the other day, I saw this beautiful ad of porpoises and the sky and the ocean, and it was brought to you by all the uh, petro farmers. I mean, it was a bit brought, no, it actually was a big pharma. It was a beautiful ad brought to you by Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, all of them at the end, all their logos, because they know they have to get ahead of all this horrible news about you know the pharmaceutical industry. So they got together and made a very beautiful, lovely PSA. It almost changed my mind about them. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe if I saw it another 10 times, it, it would. I think some drugs that have helped me a lot, so they're not all uh, you know, private farming or harmful. Uh, but it seems as though the industry hasn't been able to see. And when that John Oliver story on the TV show, The American Story, very negative, very awful. I mean, it probably cost people's lives, because if you saw this, you wouldn't want to send a loved one to treatment. Uh, one <coughs> person in America wrote a rebuttal article, uh, but the industry said, oh, we can't control the media. And I said, well, you become the media. You, you have publicists. You have people putting out honest, positive stories, and they just seem to, to, to not come out. And I think Sam was asking about several years ago, it was an article in the Orange County Register in, in Orange County uh, about a place called Sovereign Health. Uh, and a, in, in a gentleman named Tommy Sharma, who used to practice in England, but he was kicked out of this country never to be allowed back in for testing drugs on people. He wasn't telling that he was testing drugs on it. So he finds a little home in Orange County and starts a little organization called Sovereign Health multi-million dollar organization, uh, and they find out a number of scurrilous activities that they're doing. Bilking insurance company, having people die, moving them from one facility to another. So they, it was awful. They came down on this guy very heavily. Uh, and my newspaper, which is, 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 is a, is a uh, we, we correlate, we, we congregate a number of articles from each week. And so we put, we re-ran that story as was. Uh, except I put a little editorial above it, said bust it. Two weeks later I get a lawsuit for millions of dollars because that I ran, re and I said I just re-ran it. But in the, in the lawsuit it says, Yes, it was in the Orange County Register, but no one reads the Orange County Register, but everyone in the industry reads the Addiction Recovery e-bulletin, and you're costing us money because people aren't going to refer to us anymore. Uh, since the, So it took two years. The day before the trial, they decided to drop the case against me because I thought they figured they couldn't really win. Um, and then the FBI raided them, and then they got shut down. Uh, and now they've reopened as Invictus of Wyoming, mm -hmm. and they're opening up new treatment centers with the same owner. Everyone thought he was going to take his money, go back to India, uh, and, and, and avoid prosecution, but he has the guts or the gumptions or you know, the kahunas to reopen another facility. So it's not even like he doesn't have enough money. The guy's just a pathological, sociological danger to himself and others, we should do a 5150. That's in the States when they lock you up because they think you're going to hurt somebody or yourself. Anyway, I bring that story up yeah. for no particular reason, well, but actually, that made is, the news. There is a reason. 
Yeah. I've got a reason for okay. it. Okay, please. Okay, so my reason for it is I just wondered if it, you've got a question. That no, I was just going to say on, on that topic okay. um, about why is the treatment industry. Can you use um, the microphone because Leonard's sure. deaf? On to the topic that Len just mentioned about why does all the media um, around the treatment industry tend to be negative. Um, how much of that is due to the fact that, you know, if you look at the dental industry or the cosmetic surgery industry, surgery industry um, they can talk a lot about the positive outcomes that they've had. They can show pictures of dental work, they can show a picture of um, successful cosmetic surgery. You know, one thing we're hampered by is the anonymity and confidentiality that comes with it. Mm. So what are the feel-good stories that we talk about? You know, we are limited simply because of that. And I'm not saying either yes or no, but you know, as a, I do marketing for a number of treatment centers across Asia, um, you know, one of the things you're severely hampered by is the fact that the media, they want a human element, they want a story about a case study, and yet at the same time, you know, you have confidentiality, anonymity, also the fact that that person could relapse. So it's a very difficult industry to market, and I think that's one of the main reasons well, the there's a lot of negative. Well, the can't promote that, but the individual can certainly can. Sure, but and who's going to, you know, states, if we're talking about, you know, how's, why is that individual going to market it? What are they marketing? Their sobriety? You know, we're talking about how do we, yeah. you know, the treatment centre wants the to market States, it. half these rehabs wouldn't be open if it wasn't for the brave and courageous celebrities mm -hmm. who get their picture taken with, like, an M&M &M comes out publicly and says, I'm 11 years sober and I'm very proud of it. He's not promoting AA. He might not be mentioning the treatment centre that he went to. But every week there is another, and in the state, and here too, because mm -hmm. I read all your papers, and every week it seems to another you know, dicey television star has come so out. So we don't, over. so then we don't all have negative, the whole, it's not all negative then, right? Can't have it both it's ways. It's not all negative, no. Right? I, I agree, it's not all negative. I mean, the, the kind of tabloidy negative stuff obviously is, is in there and people love it, but there's a lot of positive stories mostly as well. Mostly positive. Yeah. When it comes to celebrities. Um, mostly. <laughs> one thing I'm hoping for is that over the next few years, as things have you know, started to clean up the last 18 months or a little bit more, hoping we're gonna continue down that path and that'll give more opportunity to share some of the positives in the space um, and unite some of the people that have, that's strange, <laughs> unite some of the people that have uh, kind of like uh, survived this period as well to, to again maybe even follow some, one of Leonard's ideas that he pitched to NATAP and kind of unite around some, some educational ads that there is a lot of positivity here and turn our space into something that's viewed more as the hero's journey, if you will, exactly. right? Somebody that's courageous, that can stand up against uh, stigma and do something that's really gonna be truly helpful and life-changing for themselves. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, there has been a ton of negative press, but it's also given a lot of awareness. Um, you know, a lot of people were making very uneducated decisions before going with anybody thinking this was a completely standardized space. And although it's created a lot more stigma against our industry and the treatment side of things specifically, not recovery or, or addiction or addicts or anything like that, but just the treatment side, um, which we're gonna have to battle, it also has saved a lot of lives because they've been asking more detailed questions about whose facility they're gonna go to and what is actually gonna happen there. Um, and there's a lot of people that have stayed out of bad places as a result of this negative press. So there's some positive aspects to it too. Good. <laughs> Coming from, I come from Sweden, so I come from a slightly different place. But um, can you say something about um, the idea that uh, I encounter a lot with people in the industry, especially in leadership, that since I am good and since I'm thinking good thoughts, what I'm doing has to be good. Do you get the question? No, no it's probably a language I issue. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, people, people will, yeah, good intentions. We are people with good intentions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so how can we handle the fact that sometimes our good intentions get in the way of seeing that we're not doing good work? 
And that's for me is a leadership question. Thank you, somebody on the right. <laughs> so I'd like to bring in Emily on this one, mm -hmm. please. Yeah, so it was one of the questions actually Sam posed, um, and it kind of speaks to, because I don't think we really answered Emily's question. I want to make sure we do, because yeah. there is a whole other generation of marketing, um, kind of like, I don't want to term it as a specific age generation, but there's a whole other generation coming, and, um, and how do we market it? But I'll say about leadership and about so I always say, and it's, it's actually a, t a term that I learned from the leader that I worked for for many years, and he always said, and I, and I would say it's my expert advice to anyone, if, if my best interest as a leader, as a CEO, as an owner, is what the client's best interest is or patient's best interest is, then more than likely I will have a sustainable business. So I am probably not going to engage. The hope would be if I'm going to be looking for my bottom line or how am I best going to get my quickest return, and looking for what is going to boost my company the quickest, I'm not looking at the client's best interest. So I believe that if that keeps your c consistent mission model, um, your mantra, your vision of how to run your business, then you'll be able to continue to be an ethical practice and not be able to say, I'm doing this, but I'm actually, I'm saying this, but I'm doing this. Um, and that's why for the, mar the marketing question that goes in, it's one of the questions I was talking about with Peter at lunch, is that, um, Peter Lazar over here, who's an excellent market, but worked in marketing a long time. Um, but we talked about how, a question I always ask when I visit a treatment center, and I've toured a lot of treatment centers, I'm sure a lot of us have, is the first thing I ask is when I sit down with an owner is, well, why did you start this company? Like, why? Why are you here? Um, and it's a great question to ask, and sometimes people are a little taken aback by it, and some people already have their pitch, and other people don't really know what to say. Um, and I've asked it to people who own large conglomerates, and I've asked people who own their own private centers. And so I think that's a great question to kind of find out, why did you start this? Um, and you can kind of, re as you become more educated and you learn more, you'll be able to kind of figure out like what's the truth and what's not. One of the most beautiful things I ever heard was an owner said I did it out of an act of providence, and she's kept it alive and well for over 30 years. That's a beautiful statement, and you kind of can get behind it. Um, and the other thing I would say about Emily's question, which kind of feeds to that, is as you're marketing your program, how do you know how to like stay ethical in how you market? Um, you know, you definitely have to start, I think Butch even mentioned it, look for the programs that if you know your program is ethical, align yourself with other people who are marketing for the other programs that have that same mission, vision, values that align with yours. So if you know that your company is doing the right thing for the right reason, then keeping the client's best interest is their best interest, then find those other programs or individuals or practitioners that are doing the same thing. And those are the people that you can for sure market with or col you know, collaborate with, co-sponsor with, um, because you know that they're going to do the right thing. And, um, and it's hard because the next generation of marketing, is, as I've kind of been doing more work, you see, at least in the states, they're doing a lot of this bartering system where it's like, I'll give you two IOPs for one residential and just this whole, this whole game. And the saddest part about that whole game is that it's putting the people that are doing the right thing out of, not out of business, but lowering their census because they can't keep up with that because that's not how they're doing business. But I believe that if the, the next generation of marketing, the newer marketers, if they learn kind of like what Butch has said and many of us have said, if we're aligning ourselves with people who are doing the right ethical thing, then those people aren't going to have any business left to barter because we're all doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of address that, which hopefully addresses some of that. Can I? Um, yeah. There's a question there, and then there's a question down here. Um, your mind isn't really a question per se. I'm a clinical psychologist inside the practice. Um, so my client base would include people with addiction, but it would also include people with bipolar. Um, and it seems to me that all of these questions
idea about it, the outcome measure, I think is extremely unhelpful for a question. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. not questions. Yeah. facilities or treatment centres doing some really remarkable marketing at the moment from that ethical standpoint, just to aspire Did to everybody that? hear that at the back? Okay, that, who, who's standing out as doing remarkable marketing at the moment? Yeah, in the mental health space. In the mental health yeah. space. I have an interesting example, but I don't know if it's successful. There's a treatment centre called Wavelengths in Southern California, and they had a four-page full-page ad spread in the Sunday New York Times magazine for a month. Uh, I've been calling them to try and talk to them and find out if that was a successful venture. Uh, but it certainly stood out because it could be the anecdote to all the patient brokering uh, mishigas that's going on in controversy because you're advertising to the customer, to the client, to the family, so there's no middleman, there's no fees, it's just I don't know if it's worth it for them to spend that kind of money for a New York Times Sunday magazine ad, four pages. Uh, I would say, was that? I would say an editorial would be better received than an advert. An editorial would be better received, but yet there are so many other ads in there that are obviously mm. making money for the yeah. manufacturer of the service that they're doing. So Butch has something to say about this. Uh, about uh, three years ago, Instead of you know running ads and you know we we we, get, we keep we main, we maintain the uh, uh, social media thing and all that, but we we shifted and uh, because our largest referral source is our alumni, and so we have shifted and put a lot of resources into our alumni association, which uh, that that's the best possible thing by far that we can do. And when I say we invest in that, I mean we have a uh, an aftercare and alumni coordinators that put on events for our alumni and you know that that has been wildly successful for us. So investing in our number one referent uh, which for years we just kind of oh that's just aftercare or that's you know that's just alumni that that has proven to be a really good thing. Well, you're fortunate you've been there how many years? 54. 54. So a lot more alumni than places that are only five years old. I will, so say, I will say about um, a different type of marketing effort that I found. So I'm a mother, and I was sitting at a doctor's office, and I read it was open to parenting magazine, and a tr local treatment center where I live had an ad. And I just went on their website, and I found that they have a newsletter. I was talking about this yesterday. And they have, they have a newsletter, and it's an adolescent program locally. And I, I chose to be a part of the newsletter. And I get, week, I get weekly, daily, I don't know, every other day. And the information that they're giving me is kind of like what you were talking about. They're not telling me to go, I don't, my children aren't uh, ready for treatment yet. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> please. But, because I have four of them, be really expensive. But, um, <laughs> but they're give, educating me. And the information they're giving me is very relevant as a mother, as somebody who's addressed. And it's not even just about addiction. It's about all things that us as adults and children deal with and how do how do we walk through it and I found it to be extremely effective that if today if one of my children needed treatment I would go there because they've kept in front of me they're educating me and they're doing that kind of that higher um, the top of the funnel you've probably gone and liked them on social media as well I'm off social media honestly I'm like the worst marketer for that <clears throat> I'm on a little hiatus but yes I mean I would if I was yeah Peter 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 Oh boy, quite an introduction. Um, I don't think it's working. It's a big mouth. Um, it's working. Uh, so one of the, speaking on the subject of, of, of leadership, um, in New York, in New Jersey, in uh, New England, um, and a couple of other places uh, in, in the U.S., um, we have what's called the Provider Liaison Association, and, or the PLA. And so speaking on the topic of leadership, um, some people giggled about the PLA must mean something completely different elsewhere. Okay. Um, Very different. 
I will handle, <laughs> handle this carefully. Um, <laughs> so um, the, with the PLA, um, um, our job is to, or the mission of the PLA is to help marketers, especially marketers who are coming in to the field, learn the right way to do things. Um, <coughs> because if they're working for an unscrupulous owner, they're not learning from them, right? As we say, the fish stinks from the head. So um, the PLA's mission is to educate marketers, take people, uh, take newcomers under their wing to show them uh, uh, the proper way of representing their organization um, to clinicians, to family members, to uh, other organizations, um, uh, uh, and set a standard of ethics that has to do with uh, you know proper functioning in the job. So what we're doing is we're taking the young marketers under our under our wing, and we're saying, you know, hmm, are you sure you want to do that? Because maybe you want to think about you know how this could impact uh, not only uh, uh, your reputation but the reputation of your organization. Um, and so, really, you know, in a boots on the ground kind of way. We are taking the newcomers under our wing, and hopefully, uh, will affect some change that way. And so, to that end, you can make an argument for marketers marketing to marketers. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, in the sense that treatment centers can learn from each other. You learn who the good treatment centers are. You learn who the who the um, who the uh, the bad actors are. Um, you know, just by the marketers getting to know each other. And how they do things as well. So, is it? Can I can I ask? Is it? A, is it just a regional, or is it something that people are outside of? Because I know in the UK, but specifically for this industry, yeah. that there isn't a kind of group. There's a very small pool of mar marketers actually. Um, yeah. In in the UK, is it something that would be relevant or? that there could be a connection for people? Well, I would strongly urge if there isn't a PLA here in, uh, in the UK that you start one. Um, if you go to uh, nypla.org, um, I hope that's the right website. Um, <laughs> there, yeah, it, it, should, it, it has uh, listed on it its uh, mission statement as well as its code of ethics. Now, if somebody violates that code of ethics, there's nothing we can do other than wag our fingers. But um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, look, in, at least in the case of New York, which really um, is, is becoming a challenging place to market from an ethics perspective, we're saying, look, if you're going to come into our house and, and, and work in our house, this is the bar. The bar is here. The bar is not here. It's here. And you're expected to behave uh, in, in a certain way. Um, because from a marketing perspective, you know, when you answer that call from a mom, they're having the worst day of their life. You know, and this is a, this is an honor and a privilege. And so, um, you know, I would say probably sixty to seventy percent of the time, I'm disqualifying a case for my practice or for my organization, and I'm sending them to the right place for the right reason. Um, there is a karmic aspect to the work that we do. So, for what it's worth. Well, I think it, I think it's worth worth a lot. As do I think that your Facebook feed on marketing tips is yeah. is mm -hmm. really important, um, and it's done in such a it's done in such a way that it's not um, it's not judgmental. It's just kind of keeping a an eye and a guide on you know ethical checklist and and keeping it right size. Is anybody else? I've just been wanting to say like five things. So I just wanted to say about anonymity. This is still drives me crazy. 12-step meetings are not the same thing as a treatment center. And they're not the same thing as being in recovery. And you can tell anyone that you want that you're in recovery without breaking your anonymity or anybody else's. And I'm so tired of this argument. I'm really, really tired of it. Um, and I also think that we're our own worst enemies sometimes. Like everyone in this room is actually on the same page. We all want to help people get well. That's why we're in this business, right? So we need to be whistleblowers more than we are now on the people who aren't doing ethical work. And I think this idea of an organization, we don't have one in Canada either. We need one. 
we need to be collaborating as much as humanly possible all the time because that's how we're going to save more lives, period, full stop. And my favorite word in the world is and, it's not but, it's not harm reduction or, it's not harm reduction but, it's not 12 step not, it's like, it's and. We all need to be working together. Like, so I'm not sure how that comes into a marketing perspective. I don't know how we're all going to market ourselves together, but I just think that I'm tired of fighting. It's like we all, there's a million and addicts. Right. Yeah, we can't yes. be like, and us. And exactly. So that's all I wanted to say. Well I would just like to say that the more money you make, the more people you're helping. So feel good about what we all do. Right. That could be taken a number of different ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm it's a come on. Yeah. We have 10 minutes. I'm time aware, it's 10 minutes, and I'm just wondering a couple of things. Um, are there any more resources, or are there anything else that you want from these guys, or do you want to spend 10 minutes before there's a break kind of chatting with your next door neighbor? Um, about what you do because you're all marketing and to know a bit more about each other. It, what can we give to you um, that makes you feel you're taking something away from this gathering? I don't know if I'd make a good DJ because I'm not good <laughs> with managing this side. I like, I like side. the chat to talk to your neighbor. Sure, yeah. I think that's nice. Okay, so let's take a few minutes to speak with someone we don't know in the room, please.